You are listening to From Embers, a weekly show on CFRC 101.9 FM about anarchist and anti-authoritarian ideas and practice. We are broadcasting from the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples on land that has come to be called Kingston, Ontario, Canada because of the thievery and brutality of the Canadian state and its empire-loving parents. From Embers is about fires, some real and some metaphorical. Fires started generations ago and tended to over the years. Little sparks all across this territory that we hope will grow, spread, and engulf the thieving state called Canada and the capitalist system that has plagued this land since the fur trade. Today, I'm really excited to bring you a conversation with a good friend of mine who's been writing about and recently gave a workshop presenting basic anarchist principles through the lens of the interdependence and relatedness of all people and all forms of life. So we're getting into basic questions here, like what is freedom? You might have thought that anarchists would be all about the individual, about each of us separately getting what I want. but. Here's one who says that it's not like that at all. And as a full disclosure, you're also getting a taste here of what it looks like to interview someone who you know quite well. So don't expect an impartial questioner here, and do expect occasional giggles. Uh, This is a conversation between friends, and I'm putting it on the radio. So here we go. (laughs) Sorry. It's totally okay. I'm just leaving some of the laughing and not all of the laughing. And... I would describe my personal politics as anarchist. Okay. And what does that mean to you? What's the briefest way? Like, if, like, my grandmother asked you, like, what do you mean by that? What would you say? By anarchist, I mean, the literal meaning is without rulers. And I see it as a political and philosophical orientation towards the world that is for freedom and against domination. And the workshop that I gave in the article that I'm writing, are part of it is talking about what I mean and we mean by freedom and domination as anarchists. How did you introduce yourself when you gave the workshop? Like, what information did you give about yourself to the, to the crowd? Um, I have been an anarchist for around 12 years or engaging with those ideas. Mm -hmm. I might have said that, like, I think I described, yes, I did, described coming to Montreal as an anti-capitalist and then having conversations with, like, friends who I met in student organizing who were like, anti-capitalism without a critique of the state, that sounds terrible. (laughs) And I was kind of um, tried to figure out how I related to that and, and through that process and other things became convinced of an anarchist perspective on things and also reading uh, The Dispossessed because um, I'm rereading it now for the I don't know how many of the time um, and so I pulled that out and showed it to people and then I also introduced my interest in doing the workshop as coming out of doing the writing project um, which was not ready to share with people, but that included an article I wrote by the same title as the workshop, Making Our Relationships More Free, Hmm. that was engaging with a lot of the anarchist ideas from a perspective of relationships and interdependence. And then someone from the Book Fair Collective asked if anyone wanted to do an English intro to anarchism, and I was like, yeah, I'm ready to do that, based on having thought through these ideas a lot already. When people ask you about that writing project, Mm -hmm. what do you say it is? Uh, I think I described it in the workshop as an anthology 
um, of articles engaging critically with the role of individualism in anarchism and mm -hmm. the influence of individualist ideas on anarchism. So how did you go about explaining anarchism to a room full of people who presumably aren't sure what it is? Um, I took a historical perspective and I specifically uh, explained that I was defining anarchism as a revolutionary tradition that describes itself as anarchist, which means that I'm talking about a history coming out of Europe, specifically, and contextualize that as being different than talking about societies that are organized according to many values that are shared with anarchism, like not having states, or being very horizontal or egalitarian or uh, free by anarchist criteria. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm not, I wasn't going to try to introduce the history of those because that's thousands of years and many, many different stories. And also wasn't going to talk about struggles that actually even are parallel to and overlap with anarchism, which are struggles for freedom and against domination, like currently um, ongoing, and even revolutionary ones. Um, because, and in part that's a, like some people decide to say anything that meets those different criteria on anarchist terms should just be described as anarchist, and I'm, uh, I don't agree. I prefer to use the term to refer to what the people using the term for themselves refer to, like self-identified anarchist traditions, and also, also put the scope of it as the Atlantic world, which is what I'm more familiar with, um, which includes that origin in Europe, and then also this continent. Um, mm. And also, I mean, I didn't go into a lot of detail about the, the transatlantic slave trade and taking your people out of Africa as slaves, that, that kind of interconnected world through the Atlantic that um, is both really related to the European origins of anarchism as a revolutionary tradition and really related to the current context we're in in Montreal and in North America. I haven't, it's actually been relatively recent, but I've started engaging more directly and intentionally with the specific history and theory of anarchism. Um, my version of anarchism up until more recent years was kind of like anarchism is an umbrella term that includes lots of different struggles against domination, which I don't disagree with now, but I have a more specific conception of anarchism as its own tradition and its own set of ideas, which intersects and relates to other ideas like feminism or anti-capitalism, but is different than them and is saying something more specific than those other traditions are saying. Which you're saying is for freedom against domination. That's like yeah. how you, that's what it's saying. Yeah, and it's having a particular conception of, I mean, often the term power is used, and that's one of the things I talked about in the workshop, how in English the term power can mean different things in ways that can be confusing, mm -hmm. um, cause conceptual problems. Um, but yeah, up in the general sense has an engagement with questions of power that's very specific about the forms that that takes, but how that is applied is very broad. So like, for from that anarchist perspective, there can be a critique and revolutionary challenge to many different systems of power. So even when the configurations of power change, there's still a clear anarchist critique and challenge to mm -hmm. those, those new systems. And so, I mean, at the end of the workshop, when I was talking about freedom and referencing the dispossessed more directly, it was describing how it really clearly lays out that even if there were major transformations of social organization on an anarchist basis, there would still be forms of power that anarchists would oppose, even in a self-described anarchist society, um, if such a thing could mm -hmm. come about. Um, and so it's, it's never really a process of challenging domination that has an endpoint necessarily. But that isn't to say that there are clear things that need to happen to overcome systems of domination that are there. Like those, it, there's a huge difference between a context in which that domination is entrenched and dominant and defining how everything is organized versus one that's not. So I heard from some people that you did like a really good job of defining terms. Okay. That, that was sort of your framework. Is that yeah. Would you say that's true? Um, yeah, and I, I was defining terms and kind of looking at different debates or questions within anarchism and okay. having a particular perspective on them and way of understanding them. Okay. Yeah. So, as if I'm in your workshop, tell yeah. me what is domination? Okay. Domination is when the way that uh, a 
some a living thing, a form of life, a culture, um, some part of our living world uh, is has its how it exists imposed on it from something else who that coerces it into a different way of living, usually for the benefit of those who are doing the imposing. So this like different terms are used to describe this like exploitation in which it's like a direct like taking of uh, from but also dispossession is another where it's like uh, in settler colonialism the pushing off of um, people off of land and even genocide genocide is like in a very extreme version of domination where it's the complete elimination and to making not exist of an entire people um, and so the specific forms that it takes can be different in different contexts but the general dynamic is one of, I actually had different ways of describing it here. When someone could decide from something for themselves, but someone else is going to decide it for them. Um, that's like a basic dom mm. um, dynamic of domination. Um, and what are some of the other key terms that you felt you should define to start? Uh, for domination, other basic things of it are like hierarchy and inequality. So like I've in the past often thought of this, of the, the shape of the triangle, like there are certain uh, those who are on top and then many who are below who are not in control. So that kind of pyramidal structure is like basic to domination. That's how states are organized and militaries are organized and how capitalism structures things. And that's hierarchy. That's hierarchy. Yeah. Okay. And then inequality along with that is too. And inequality in the sense of outcomes in terms of who is hurt and who benefits, um, but more fundamentally a, an ethical inequality, like some are worth more and others are worth less. And so uh, more in the writing project than what I talked about in the workshop, I think it's important to look at the, the, the importance of a ethical equality, like an understanding that all things have their worth in the world and that should be respected. And I think that's basic to uh, freedom. So uh, that was another term that I was uh, trying to define and talk about is freedom. And that's kind of the core one. I would even say that how I talk about domination is really informed first by how I think of what freedom is, um, which is the ways in which we're able to change ourselves and determine what how we exist, which in a relational context, which is the other major discussion I was getting at with the workshop, we exist through our relationships. So this is something I kept coming back to through all the different points that I'm talking about freedom and domination and revolutionary change is that all of these things are happening in the context of uh, relationships and interdependence and so because what what that means is that it's our relationships that are what make us what we are so we can exp we see this in our day-to-day -day lives of like we're affected by those around us but even in a more basic sense, like all of the material that makes up our body comes to us through ecosystems, through like food, but also through social and cultural systems that bring us that food. And we're all interwoven and made up culturally, physically, and socially and emotionally by all the, the world around us um, at various levels and in different ways. And so that fundamental interdependence of our existence um, means that um, this is an engagement critically with the especially coming out of Europe idea of the individual and individualism and our existence as individuals and this is core to liberal thought about how we exist in the world which emerged with capitalism and is kind of an ideological framework for capitalism in some basic ways but anarchism also emerged out of those same revolutions that liberalism and capitalism emerged out of and so that idea of the individual is pretty important to anarchism as well. Um, and so I think it's a, something that anarchism can learn from outside of its cultural and historical origins is to look to other contexts and places where this idea of the individual is not um, present. I gave the example in the workshop of wage labor and how under capitalism our individual existence is made very real socially. Like we have jobs as individuals and we can get those jobs and lose them and change them and we all make that choice on an individual basis. And that isn't how life and survival and organization of work happens in all places in the world in different times. Like in many places and many times, 
those choices are completely on a collective basis and people are working and surviving and figuring out making those choices with other people inherently and they conceive of themselves and their existence in those terms more often as well um, and so it's a particular social form that we live in that makes that individual existence that we have something that's very common sense like yes of course we exist as individuals and I do think that in a more uh, real way it is true that everyone regardless of their cultural context has certain aspects of existence that are on that individual basis like we specifically are like sens sensory perception of the world like what we're able to know directly through our senses and the um, cognition that we have going on in our brains about like thinking about I'm gonna make this choice those are heavily mediated by cultural context and a lot of other inter interdependent things but they do happen in a biological way on an individual basis and I don't want to disregard that, but I think liberalism does a thing of taking that aspect of our existence and basically saying that's it, like that's the fundamental thing and everything else only can be understood in terms of that. And that's not, I don't think that's true at all. Um, and that's the thing I push back against. regular anarchist radio show based out of Kingston, Ontario.
All of the music in tonight's show is by Claiborne, a Montreal-based post-hardcore band that plays songs based on Kim Stanley Robinson's Red Mars trilogy. So I think some people would say it sort of sounds like you're saying that, like, we don't actually have free will, like, we're not actually individual actors, and, like, that might be inherently antithetical to people's sense of, like, what freedom means. Mm -hmm. So how do you see that? as like useful like how do you see that as like freedom giving to think about ourselves as like all sort of one species being or as like all connected to each other mm-hmm. or like how how does that bring us freedom how can that have anything to do with freedom to think about it that way um it leads to a conception of freedom that is freedom through our relationships and so freedom is a form that our relationships take or a way that our relationships look and specifically if freedom is being able to change ourselves then it means freedom is being able to change our relationships but changing them means being able to see them and know them and this is another aspect of domination if people are engaged in a dynamic of domination it usually means that those there there's certain information that they can't be seen those who are benefiting from the domination push away the consequences that that has for the people who um, are dominated, and they there's like a certain aspect of um, occlusion or like a not not direct communication because honest and direct communication would um, undermine the relationship of domination, and conversely, those who are dominated also are there's an intentional like would keep information away from them. So because having that information would make them better able to resist that domination. And so the inf- information doesn't flow in a context of domination and in a context of freedom it has to in order for people to like be able to say this is what I want things to be. This is how it is and this is how I want it to be and to change. And that, that uh, process of being able to negotiate relationships and have them change on the terms that uh, people want them to change on is... Uh, how I would think of what freedom is. Um, mm-hmm. Another way that comes to mind for me of thinking about that is um, respectful coexistence, where it's like there are different things, but they're in relation to each other, and it's the process of figuring out how that relationship is going to change, which is to say how the those who are in the relationship are going to change themselves. So you're basically saying like you're defining freedom as the ability to change yourself. Yeah. Um, but the you in that isn't. It's many. Yes. Different. Yeah. But like, what if like I thought freedom meant I could get what I want and do right. what I want? Does it just not mean that, or can you like connect those two things? Right. So that when our relationships are in a context of domination, then it there's a part of this, especially when our individual existence is taken for granted. There's it makes sense to think, well, if I withdraw from those relationships of domination, then I'm more free because I'm not being dominated in these ways. Uh, And I think that depends on uh, an understanding of uh, our existence that isn't inherently relational. Because if we're withdrawing from certain relationships, that means we're just entering into other ones. Um, And I think that is limited as a conception of freedom that we if we less less relationships less dependencies means freedom um, i don't think it's real um, or it's like a false sense of freedom and the other part of what you're asking was what if i think freedom means i can do what i want right so doing what you want um when i talked in the workshop about domination that was also where i made the distinction between what I call domination and capacity. And so this is getting at this uh, dual nature or unclear nature of the word freedom, or no, sorry, the word power in English. So uh, domination, I've been describing what that means. And by capacity, I mean just the ability to do things in the world. So have an, uh, an impact on the world. And I think it's important to make the distinction but also recognize there is a relationship between those in especially in the sense that major differences in capacity between in a relationship are a context in which domination can really easily happen and so it's really important to have a particularly focused vigilance to avoid and prevent 
relations of domination when there's those differences in capacity. Um, and I give the example of um, relationships between adult humans and, and younger humans, um, which in our, in our culture, um, to the extent that it's not completely um, terrible, patriarchal and dominating, there's a recognition that that's a, that those intergenerational dynamics are really sensitive and important to be aware of power dynamics within. Um, mm. And, but that plays out at many different levels. Um, but so I think capacity is important. I'm critical of the anarchist primitivist perspective that capacity is inherently, my, my take on it of what they're saying is capacity is inherently domination. Um, and the more capacity we have, the more domination there is. And that leads back, that leads to a perspective that like, what was the earliest emergence of human capacity? And that's when things started going wrong, <laughs> which, um, and I, I disagree. I also though disagree with um, what is pretty inherent to capitalist narr narratives of progress and increase in capacity, which is that that's only possible through domination, and but it's worth it because capacity in itself is inherently good. And being able to do things in the world is inherently good. And there's some anarchists who think this as well. And I disagree with that as well. I think it's important to have a sort of neutral perspective on capacity and look at capacity as a thing that we want to be able to happen in many, many different ways, to have a diversity of capacities that can kind of, co and this is part of this coexistence, different ways of life based on very different kinds of capacity can coexist with each other. Uh, an example I give of this in the writing project but didn't bring up in the workshop is um, like plant knowledge coming out of cultures that are very <coughs> based in and aware of a particular ecology and therefore know what effects plants, different plants have on our bodies and how to relate to those plants and how to um, use them in ways that are respectful to the plant and have it able to continue its way of life. And often in indigenous cultural contexts, this is mm. how plants and medicine are related to. And, and then on the other hand, there's pharmaceuticals, which is like a very different way based on knowledge of like biochemistry and how to synthesize certain molecular components. And, um, pharmaceuticals can have a more potent impact on our bodies. Like things can be done with pharmaceuticals that are not possible to do with plants. Um, but that, and, but the plant knowledge also isn't completely subsumed within the pharmaceutical knowledge. Like there's things that people who have lived in relation to an ecosystem for thousands of years will know that people making pharmaceuticals don't know. And that's why pharmaceutical researchers will go to indigenous peoples and say, tell us about the plants that are really potent. And then like go, steal things from them. Yeah. yeah. But I, I think in a context of domination, it's stealing it because it's an exploitive capitalist mm -hmm. pharmaceutical industry in a colonial context, dominating those indigenous people. And that's exactly what I'm against in the world. And I think what we should be fighting, but I don't think that that context of domination is inherent in the relations of different kinds of capacity between the kinds of ways of life that lead to pharmaceutical knowledge and the kinds of ways of life that lead to plant knowledge, I think it's possible to imagine and actually really important to strive for as anarchists a context in which there could be a respectful coexistence between pharmaceutical researchers and indigenous peoples who know about plant medicine. Those capacities could um, be free in relation to each other. Um, indigenous um, plant knowledges could mix there could be indigenous biochemical research that could be going on that is also respectful to the plants and understanding the relationship with the plants like as, as mm -hmm. a kind of example of what becomes possible when freedom is a reality in the world um, mm -hmm. as opposed to domination which results in a those ways of life that give the most capacity to f over other parts of life end up being the ones that pro propagate themselves and destroy everything else which is describes what our world looks like right now so if freedom is like the capacity to change ourselves, to make ourselves, do you think there are any people in this world that are free now? Um, I talked about two examples in relation to freedom that kind of give some ideas about how it relates to capacity. On the one hand, um, one important political influence for me has been the Zapatista struggle in southern Mexico. Um, indigenous revolutionaries who have carved out autonomy in their um, some parts of their communities and, and land. And in that case, they actually rejected, like part of being Zapatista is to reject any material aid or support or services from the government. Mm -hmm. And that means for people who are like poor and marginalized in a lot of ways, 
it's actually very difficult to live without those external supports, but they come with strings attached. And even though the concept of coming with strings attached is kind of what domination is about, it's like you're going to be controlled and have to follow a certain way of life if you engage in this relationship. Um, and so they cut off that relationship with the government of that type. And that, that's in a lot of ways less capacity. They don't have access to medical care. They don't have access to building materials or whatever it is. Um, and, but they're more free as a result. And their process of what they call building autonomy has been one of developing different relationships with supportive allies in Mexico and elsewhere in the world, including anarchists, in order to build their own indigenous language-based and like culturally-based and also anti-capitalist services and um, things that they need in their communities. And that, so it, in that sense, having less capacity, at least in that sort of shorter term offered by the government way, makes them more free. And then the flip side of this is looking at the, the US military, probably one of the most powerful, both in the sense of capacity and domination organizations in the world. Um, which is not free at all. Like from the soldiers who are in it, it, they just have to follow orders inherently in being a soldier that they're conditioned to not be able to decide what their choices are going to be like. Um, to the, the generals, those who are leading, they're very actively and in a very long-term sort of focused way engaged in these dynamics of competition and domination in order to maintain the U.S. military as that um, superior force in the world um, to I mean then there's the political and economic elites in the US who benefit directly and indirectly from those deployments of violence by the uh, US government largely in an economic way um, but they especially the corporate elites are engaged in their own version of those dynamics uh, of domination where they're trying to compete and stay on top of their respective industries um, and I can't imagine that being any kind of freedom either. Like they're, they're very much forced by those dynamics to behave in certain ways. I mean, it's kind of a bit of a, uh, not a thing I care about that much, but I think it is related to this discussion that people in those elite positions of power are actually very f***ed up in their like mental health and like ways that they relate to their lives. Like they like, um, and that I don't think matters at all. And some people in a like, class struggle away would be like yeah f them <laughs> let them suffer or whatever um but i i think it's a they're i don't think they're free like i don't think the life that they have or the as a class or as individuals or on any, any level is about freedom at all um whereas i do think poor indigenous people in mexico like trying to figure out their basic economy to live in a very not having of large amounts of capacity way is more freedom than like political elites in the US who are directing trillions of dollars worth of military power hmm. are free. Um, so I think there, it's not at all a one-to-one -one, like freedom to capacity mm -hmm. kind of correspondence. And that's really important to recognize, big challenge. What do you mean by revolution or revolutionary? So revolution is, uh, in large part, an orientation towards changing the set of relationships of domination in the given context, and not just little, not just pieces of it, but the whole of a uh, system of domination. So, I, and I didn't really get more precise about what that means exactly. How big can that context be? I think like, it's global. I actually did say that. I so think, it's only a global revolution that would be like an anarchist revolution for because you. Because our interdependence in the world is so global now, I think that that has important implications for what revolutionary change would look like in the world. And I think it, it leads to a, a way in which uh, things can spread very quickly. Things, because things happening in one place aren't actually separate from things happening in another place because of the relationships and independence that exist. I think actually it's a important aspect of domination to try to make these separations more real. And this is like, what people describe as alienation of like you are dependent there is a relationship that exists but you don't know the knowledge of what that relationship entails isn't communicated mm -hmm. through it and that's related to what i was saying about information and domination earlier um and mm -hmm. that kind of like segregation of an interdependent system into different not intelligible worlds is like a really 
basic, like another basic aspect of domination is divide and conquer. Like keep people separate in order to not have them able to be free. Okay. I can see that feeling like really abstract compared mm-hmm. to the world we live in now. Like what are things that anarchists do that you see as like related to these goals? Mm, in terms of global revolutionary struggle? <laughs> Uh, or what? Which goals? What do anarchists do? I guess that even counts as anarchist practice by this this understanding. Oh, of, okay. Um, I mean, I think it, it gets to like really basic things where all of our relationships in which we're attempting to relate to each other in a or other parts of the world too. The, another thing I haven't mentioned is that what our relationships look like. The, the main ex- one of the main examples I gave of interdependence and as a reference outside of what I was talking about was. The, the Haudenosaunee Thanksgiving Address, which is kind of a just very straightforward outlining of here are the different interdependences we have between humans and other forms of life, um, the non-human world, and that... Uh, so in all of these relationships that make us what we are and, and make our lives possible, trying to figure out ways to have those relationships exist and not be domination um, I think most of what anarchists are able to do most of the time is not a revolutionary version of that. But then that gets into the questions of anarchist strategy. How are we orienting our anarchist activity towards a situation where that kind of revolutionary change is possible or is more active? And we know from history there are certain times when that kind of revolutionary change happens way uh, faster or like is a thing that is... Um, I see history showing quick transitions from periods when things seem to be very stable and change and not changing very much in terms of what relationships look like, how political configurations are organized and economics and lots lots of different interrelated elements that make up our social world uh, are relatively stable to moments when they change really quickly. And I think uh, an important part of anarchist revolutionary strategy for me is orientation towards those moments to be able to engage in them too have those changes that happen really quickly move the relationships more in a direction of freedom so that a different period of stability a new normal that emerges out of that context is one that's more free rather than less that that in terms of anarchist revolutionary strategy that's a basic orientation that i think is important in terms of anarchist lives and like what we're doing i think it's part of it is strategy part of it is figuring out what our our lives look like part of it is ethical choices about um what's right and wrong in terms of how we live. There's a lot of like culture, cultural change is a huge part of what anarchists have done and continue to do, um, which all of these things can be related to each other in terms of revolutionary strategy or um, ethics or different things. But uh, at a certain point it becomes like, we do lots of things <laughs> and try to have this orientation in them. Do you think that trying to build autonomy locally, like trying to push the state out of a territory and create alternatives in that territory can be a part of something that's still revolutionary, that's still Mm -hmm. about a global revolution? I don't think that it's possible to be sure what impact doing something on what we're thinking of as a local level means for in the context of what else is happening in the world. Like, looking back historically, we know that a lot of things that look really similar will happen in a lot of different places at once, and I don't think anybody's even really exactly sure why that is. Like, it kind of seems like people see what's happening in another place and then replicate it, but also sometimes it's not that. It's, like, partially just that the conditions in the different places end up being similar, and so people respond in similar ways. And sometimes it's even not even, it's not even sure that it's that. It's, like, just unclear what it is that means that these things happen really simultaneously um and so based on that kind of like it's really com- complex and we don't fully understand why it happens in the way that it does i think that that really mitigates my any certainty i have about responding to your question like i think people should do what they think they need to do and i think i it's probably one of my more like hopeful orientations is I have an expectation that it's very possible that at a certain point we will be like holy shit, this thing is happening all over the world and we don't we aren't sure why and we didn't see it coming I think it's almost certain that we won't see it coming because if we did then probably those who would be trying to control it would also see it coming 
Um, so these kind of things that are going to have a major impact are likely to come and vote in ways that aren't anticipated. I mean, the Zapatistas are a clear example of that. They were like organizing a revolutionary self-defense and then offensive sort of capacity to carry out a revolutionary uprising for many, many years and without the knowledge of, without public knowledge or the knowledge of the Mexican government. Um, to the point where they were doing it so much that actually randomly patrolling through the woods, Mexican military forces ran into their trainings and stuff and they got in firefights, but there's lots of people with guns in the jungle and stuff, so they didn't really know what that meant and didn't really try to figure it out. Um, and then, surprise, surprise, there's this like thousands of people and like many men, even tens of thousands of people, communities all rising up at once and pushing out the government and taking over towns and things. And uh, yeah, I think the most important things will come as a surprise. But they saw it coming. Yes, they did. They planned for it. They did. And like presumably we could too. We could, totally. (laughs) I think there's, this gets into a really important point in these kind of discussions and related to freedom of like the difference between things that happen in the world uh, in ways that nobody really understands how they're happening versus things that people make plans for and have agency over and like decide are going to happen in the ways that they want to. And this is a really important question in the revolutionary strategy kind of context. And I think it's always some mix of both of those things. Like, even in the most intentional and planned contexts, things are happening in ways that people aren't even fully read. That's how they got to that point. And those contexts come about because of much longer histories leading to that point that aren't necessarily like anyone's plans. Um, But at each step of the way, people were like, this is wrong. We need to change this in this direction. And they try this thing. And then everything's different and then somebody else tries a different thing and there's these layers of of struggle and change that can build towards a certain direction um and and this is where looking at things in a broader than our individual experience of them ends up being really important because any of these kind of struggles not just in the moment is bigger than any one person's ability to like relate to it or make decisions about it it's also they happen over longer time scales than any individual person's life too so like the things that we decide to do and the impact they have changes things in ways that then makes it different when other people are trying to do the same thing in a different context. And so um, I think it's a major downfall. I actually try to avoid using the word revolution in the like the noun sense, because that gives a sense that it, it's a singular plan or a singular like moment that happens after which things are, are different. And I think moments are an important way that this process happens like things will speed up at certain times and change becomes more possible so orientation towards those moments is important but the entire process of revolutionary change can be like waves and waves of those moments in different ways Uh, how do people respond to this workshop like how did the workshop go it seemed to be really positive um people uh seemed to really i think people appreciated the discussion times interspersed throughout. I know I did because I don't like talking that for that long and and I often get frustrated with myself because I get the sense that other people are frustrated with how long can one person just keep talking at other people for. Uh, There's a tension in Montreal Anarchist Book Fair workshops though where when people try to mitigate that dynamic of one person talking at other people by having it be a more open and participatory process you end up with other people who are less prepared and less coherent talking to other people and that is even worse and so and it ends up with the discussion being really unfocused and pointless feeling and so my compromise for how to deal with that was to only I would be the only one primarily who would be talking to the entire group but the group would talk to each other um, throughout in order to uh, in small groups in small groups and do you think people came away from it like understanding anarchism better than when they entered? Yes, I think they did. I think I I feel like the process of thinking through the, these ideas has made me understand anarchism better than I did before I started. <laughs> and I feel like it's my psych, psyche, psychological orientation is t- I tend to make myself better able to deal with the situation by putting a structure around it and kind of making it more clear for myself through that structure and I feel like the process of this writing project and what I've done in this workshop is providing a certain structure around certain 
this idea as a leadership so that I can relate to them more clearly. And I think other people will like also respond the same way of being like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Like, and people are coming up to me and being like, where's more stuff I can find about the difference between like domination and capacity? And I was like, cool, great. I actually don't know <laughs> some sci-fi that I've read or this blog I saw once, but but yeah, people seem to be really. And then there's people coming up and being like, I'm really into like co-ops and that part of things. Like, not everyone necessarily like ended up having the same priorities that I did in terms of what I was outlining, which isn't wasn't an expectation. But I think I they still get. I hope and I get the impression that it provides a framework in which they can understand how the things that they're interested in fit into the broader context of what people are trying to do through this revolutionary project. Are you trying to make more anarchists? <laughs> like, build them myself? Like, Legos? <laughs> oh, I mean, are you? <laughs> no, 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 I mean, like, uh, like, is doing a 101 or something like that? Like, right, is that part right. of a project of, like, recruitment um, or influence even? Like, Right, yeah, I mean, influence in relation to the ideas that I'm expressing, that kind of influence is an important question of, like, I mean, part of why I talked about things the way I did in terms of this is what anarchism is, here's how it relates to other broadly left traditions that are not anarchist, here's within anarchism how the things that I am into and am going to talk about a lot fit into other anarchist ideas that are different than that. I'm trying to put in a broader context these specific things that I'm focusing on in order to give people a sense that, uh, in order to allow people to be free in the context of relating to what I'm saying. Like they can go out and find out about those other things that aren't the things that I'm um, that I think, because I also want to be honest with people, this is actually what I think is right, ethically correct, or true about how the world works. And so it's, I think that's an important, in terms of knowledge and relationships of domination, a really important thing of how to be honest about what you think. And in saying what you think, especially when you believe it strongly and have thought about it a lot, clearly having an influence on people, because it's like compelling argument where it's a lot of details about a particular perspective while also um, it, it's a, there's a particular anarchist perspective on manipulation that I've read where manipulation is a relationship in which important information that is known to be important for making a choice about a particular question is omitted from the conveying of that information. Um, so I I, I want people to become anarchists with the understanding broadly of what that means. Okay, but there's lots of kinds of pain that are caused by deciding to live a revolutionary life. That's true. Like, even just knowing, like, a kind of, like, emotional state of, like, wow, I'm so far from the world I want. Yeah. Like. That's true. I don't feel certain that, like, revolutionaries are happier than like liberals, for example, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like that's not why I do it, I do it because I think that like more revolutionaries yeah. will mean we're closer to a revolution, which I think is good. Yeah, yeah. But I definitely don't think it's like for them in some kind of like emotional sense necessarily. Mm -hmm. No, and I, I actually think that, uh, I'll, I think the things I'm saying about freedom are consistent with people feeling better about their lives in the sense of, I think, uh, having a sense that the world there's some deeply wrong things with the world but not being sure why or what you can do about it actually is very psychologically difficult and actually describes a lot of people's experience and actually people experience anarchism in that context as like a release of like oh this makes a lot more sense and even, and the the preference of I know what needs to happen even if I'm not succeeding at it but I'm aware that this is the direction that things need to go in versus a sort of directionless malaise about like everything's f***ed up but what even is possible kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, I don't feel like we always do a good job of providing direction though, like I feel like a lot of people are like, they, there's like this really widespread sense that like they do know where we should go, mm -hmm. but like have no, no ideas that they're confident about and mm -hmm. feel might actually work about what to do to get there. Right, and that's the revolutionary strategy questions, and that actually is the thing that ultimately I think is more important than actually I put more time into than I do what has been the focus of this intro to anarchism and the writing project. I actually, as you know, felt very conflicted about the writing project, partially out of a like sense of where my priorities are in terms of 
what I think needs to have more time put into it, uh, and what feels like I'm doing what I need to do and what I want to do in this direction. Um, and that is way more oriented towards the revolutionary strategy questions in practice and trying to figure them out than like interdependence and how we exist and like <laughs> these broader questions, which are great for being able to talk to people about where anarchism is, which I think has a role in like what we're trying to do more broadly. So I, I think it is worthwhile. Like maybe they'll come it. to you next year and be like, I have this idea for strategy. What do you think about <laughs> it? You know, that is definitely not my like intentional <laughs> even hope <laughs> about what this is. But maybe the, some of them will read the Revolutionary Abolitionist Movement book, Bringing Down the American Plantation, that I, I wrote up on the chalkboard in the classroom, the, some of the books I was referring to. Um, there was The Dispossessed, Barry Sukhila Gwynn, an article called 22 Theses on Anarchism, Revolution is More Than Just a Word by Gabriel Kuhn. Uh, the Peter Gelber's book, Worshipping Power, has a like longer history of these questions beyond that few hundred years in the Atlantic world that I was talking about, and also looking more at the what I kind of introduce things with in terms of what I mean by the scope of anarchism, of all those things that are not described as anarchist, but have many similar ways of organizing things in terms of not being states in that book. And that book's an excellent uh, critique of any uh, determinism of domination, like things have to be uh, take the forms of domination that our society totally has a lot of propaganda and social organization to reinforce the idea that this is the only way that things could be and that just is like going through here's all the ways that things have taken many different forms and it's really about the choices that people make about how they want to be free in different ways and struggle for that that determine what their society and culture look like not things like what, how they make food or how they organize in cities versus more nomadic groups or any of those kind of more basic questions of social organization and survival are really different than whether things have, are organized in terms of domination or not. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. I feel like we probably should go to this punk show. Yeah. <laughs>